Okay, everybody, I think we can get started. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Associate Professor Anne Gaskett today from the University of Auckland. Um, Anne studies, teaches, and makes discovery about plants, uh, plants now, about animals, their behavior and relationship with other animals, plants, and fungi. So, um, and did her uh, PhD at Macquarie University in 2008, and then um, did a research fellowship um, at the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior, uh, Behavior at the Cornell University in the US um, between 2014 and 2019, and then um, moved on to be a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland. Um, and will be talking to us today about sensory traps, uh, sexual deceptive orchids and conserving seabirds. And Anne assured me that there will be a connection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, thank you to traditional custodians of the land, uh, past and present, and um, welcome. I acknowledge, uh, extend that acknowledgement and respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are here with us today or joining us on Zoom. Hello. Um, I'm from Australia originally. Oh, sorry. Let me move that a little bit better. Okay, let's try that. I'll speak up a bit. I'm from Australia originally, but now I work in New Zealand and I work at a government institution in New Zealand, which makes me very much a treaty partner, a partner for the Treaty of Waitangi, to Tiriti of Waitangi. So tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko and gasket, tēnā koutou No Melbourne, aho, no Tassie, aho. Ke te kura mātauranga koiora, wai papa tōmatarō, tāmaki mikoro, aotearoa, aho. E mahiana. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's great to meet you all. Um, telling you a little bit about myself and where I'm from. So I was born in Melbourne. My family, my mum's from Tasmania and my dad's from Beechworth. That's Kelly country. And um, now I find myself living in New Zealand for about the last 15 years or so. It's a, a wonderful place for people with an interest in nature and plants and animals, but it's also wonderful to be back here and joining today. So now we need to check for our connections. Do we have anyone from the beautiful Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the house today. We do. Kia ora. Nice to see you. Any Tasmanians? Country Victorians? My husband, who you may have met at last week's test seminar, he's from Stall in Western Victoria. It's important that we check where we're from and what we share and what connects us. Well, it's lovely to see you today. Um, I'm very interested in how things connect and biodiversity, and that sort of is part of everything I do in my research, but also in my teaching and my service, which is all about equity and diversity and celebrating and championing that. So if you are an early career person who's um, thinking about applying for jobs, maybe you have a sense of concern about how do you talk about yourself in an authentic way, but then you're also you know, applying to these big um, sets of criteria then you may like to talk to me as well about writing job applications because recruitment, particularly from an equity perspective and retention of wonderful, talented people is um, a strong part of what I do at the university as well as research on sensory ecology. So uh, I didn't realise I was doing sensory ecology for a long time, but now I realise that's what I'm doing. And I love it because it brings all these diverse things together. So part of it is thinking about the, the traits of the plant or the animal. So here I have a, uh, oh, there we go. Thanks, Yoko, this is good. Some lovely sexually deceptive orchids, thinking about the shape of them. I've got a little bit of spectral reflectance data, thinking about the colour traits. This is some smell data about the compounds that are produced by some mosses that I study. So that's definitely part of it, thinking about those traits. But the next part of it is thinking about the animal's behaviour and that might be the behaviour of signalling, producing your signals or responding to signals, but also other aspects to do with processing and learning. And here's our first seabird of the session. Um, 
This is a little petrol. Actually, it's not little. It's quite a sturdy sized petrol, quite a decent meal's worth, I expect. And it's coming to a speaker that's playing bird calls. Also, there's a very strong evolutionary context to sensory ecology, thinking about, well, why is that animal or plant signaling or responding like that? How is it affecting its fitness? Um, I have a particular interest in deception and deceptive relationships because in that case you've got, you know, often plants getting animals to do something for them where there's no reward for the animal. You know, animals, I think they're so smart. Then a plant comes along, fools them. I'm very interested in how that works. Um, the other thing that I really like about studying sensory ecology is it has a lot of people in it too. I mean, it's really important. I actually think a fundamental part of the scientific process is sure, come up with a hypothesis. But I also think it's, you know, find your team, develop your relationships to create that project and make it happen. So I actually think that should be considered a fundamental part of the scientific process. But an interesting part of doing sensory ecology as a human is acknowledging our own biases, maybe our own sensory biases, as we explore and try and perceive a world that's evolved for you know, animals to perceive, birds, reptiles, how are our um, kind of sense of perception being part of that? Because um, one of the main things is our own senses and how we're limited them by them, because everybody knows, don't they, that humans have a bad sense of smell? Everyone knows that, right, because dogs are so good at smelling and everyone knows that people have a bad sense of smell. Do they or do they? Let me show you this great study. So this picture here, uh, at the front we have a, this is a dead pheasant, and here this is a dog. And the dog has a collar on which has lights on it. And so what we can see behind us, the swirly zigzag in red, is that dog's movements captured by a, a long exposure on the camera as the dog has followed the scent trail, which is what is shown in the straight lighter colored line here. That's where this dead pheasant has been dragged across this paddock. And what we're looking at there is how the dog has followed that. You know, dog has great sense of smell. Okay, this is the next part of this study. That's a person. <laughs> And she's tracking a smell across the grass that has been dragged there earlier, and it's the smell of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and she's blindfolded. She's got earphones on as well. Um, and she's tracking that smell across the grass. And I think I could probably do that quite well. Um, and interestingly, over the days when they did the study, what they found is that people got faster their velocity, the way they moved across the ground got faster. And also, they also increased their sniff frequency over the days. So people very quickly adapted their sensory methods, their sniff frequency, and then were able to smell that smell really well. So humans do actually have a really great sense of smell. I don't know why we're so... <laughs> I wonder if they had to be primed with chocolate the previous day, just the aroma to get them in the right frame of mind for it. So people are very good at smelling and they get much better over time. And this is a reminder that the process is to do with sensory things. It's not just about your underlying equipment or the animal's underlying equipment. It's also to do with other aspects like learning and processing of that information. Um, I love this study as well because they explored a little more about how people were able to track so well. Because typically when we think about being able to localise a signal, we might be thinking about vision or hearing. And we think that having two organs is very important for that. You know how if you cover one eye, it's hard to judge a distance? Yeah, and it's quite hard for people. We're quite good to be able to localise a sound in that plane because we've got the two ears. But as soon as the sound moves up or down, it's actually quite hard for us to localise it. You know, if someone's calling out to you from like an upstairs window and you're like, where is that person? And they're right there. That would never happen to you if you were an owl because owls have one ear slightly higher than the other so they can hear across the horizontal plane but also the vertical. Um, so it turns out we can do that with our nose as well. Even though our nostrils are quite close to each other, so this is the nasal apparatus that was being worn by these student volunteers. 
And so she has like a little mask and something going into her nose. And in some of the trials, they had the two nostril treatment. So each of those little pegs in her nose was just a little hollow tube so she could still use her left and right nostril. And in some of the trials, each of those little pegs actually led to a central out point or actually the in point, isn't it, where the air goes in. And so um, they compared whether there was some sort of advantage to having two nostrils rather than one. And the people who had any trials where they were able to access both of their nostrils, they were much more likely to be able to complete that trial than whenever they had the single nostril. And that's because our left and right nostrils have different air speeds. I can't feel it if I go slowly, but if I do a good, I can really feel one side of my nostril being colder than the other. I don't know if anyone, do you want to try? Who's got a faster left nostril? Who's got a faster right nostril? One of them's meant to be more common. Perhaps it's the right one. We certainly had more. So there's aspects to do with having the underlying equipment, but also the way in which we use the equipment or learn to use it and also processing aspects. So in this case, it's that the information from the left and right nostrils arrives in our brains at slightly different speeds. And because of that, we're able to tell which direction the smell is stronger from. Oh, very cool. So these things all lead to aspects of, of sensory bias. We have all this background equipment, we have learning, and then we have biases towards particular types of, of information. So I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about primates. Um, lemurs have two photoreceptor types. So they have photo, so their vision is sort of tuned to blue and green wavelengths. So this picture here across the bottom is the nanometers wavelengths that um, I guess animals, some animals, most animals see sort of somewhere between 300 to 700, but it varies for the various species. So lemurs kind of see mostly the 400 to 600 region. And in places where Madagascars are, where Madagascars, where lemurs are abundant like Madagascar, um, they're the main fruit dispersers. So lemurs, two photoreceptor types common in Madagascar where they do the job of fruit dispersal. Just nearby, there's another group of primates, which like us, have three photoreceptor types. So we've suddenly got the addition of a red photoreceptor here. And the study I'm talking about focused on Uganda, where chimps were the main fruit dispersers. Um, now, given what we've just learned about the types of receptors that chimps and Madagascars have, chimps and lemurs have, what colour do you think the fruit are in how red do you think the fruit are in Uganda versus Madagascar? I'm sure you can hear. Yeah, it's exactly what you expect. So the fruit in Uganda is much more likely to be red. And in Madagascar, it's actually yellowness. The fruit are much more likely to be yellow. And this isn't any kind of phylogenetically linked aspect. Feel free to have a look at the paper, but it's very much that the fruit that are very noticeable to chimps are the ones that they're eating. And then, of course, those are the fruit that are being dispersed and the trees that are growing. So the underlying sensory biases of these animals are having really big ecosystem effects. They're selecting for the colours of the fruit. And I think there's a lot of um, uh, parallels there with when we do hiring and we're choosing people for jobs, choosing based on kind of your preconceived notions rather than being more open to a broader range of capacities and talents limits us in who we end up hiring and that very much limits and changes the, the ecosystem that we work in. So, you know, we say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is primates, humans, we've, we're much more uh, evidence-based, aren't we? We would never be manipulated by our sensory biases. Um, I think there's a special role for red for people. We're just primates. We're doing our best in this world, but gee, we love red. And I think that there's a lot of uh, attraction and um, feelings about red. Now, these might be to do with our 
uh, underlying red photoreceptors, or it might be to do with learned associations, but I think they're nonetheless there. And here's a study about the combat sports results from the Olympics in 2004. And in these combat sports, people get randomly assigned whether they're going to have the red or the blue outfit at the Olympics. Um, so wouldn't we expect it to be equally likely to win regardless of wearing the red or the blue because it's randomly assigned? Well, these are all the different sports and the colour of the outfit that the person who won was wearing. Here's another one. This one's from about Taekwondo, and the paper is called When the Referee Sees Red. And they had recorded bouts, just video clips, and they showed them to people who were very experienced, skilled Taekwondo referees uh, who, you know, graded them according to the World Taekwondo Federation rules. So you get points for you know, the level of difficulty and the skill involved in the, the, the work, the bout. And this is the original recording, and people who were wearing red, in this case, it was always competitor A, was um, given more points. And then they changed the colours in the same video. So they reversed the blue and red and showed the same video clips to, you know, a different set of judges. And suddenly that competitor A, who was no longer wearing red, got a worse score. And competitor B, who was suddenly wearing red and these manipulated things, won the bout more often. Uh, and there was no effect of the total number of points awarded for original versus colour reversed. It wasn't something to do with the image looking weird. And didn't matter whether people saw an original or a reversed first. It was all independent. So, you know, we're just people doing the best we can. Last one on this. This is a study where people were given red, blue or white to wear. And they did various activities and these were professional athletes. But the bit that really intrigued me was how people's lift strength changed when they were wearing red than when they were wearing other colours. Does maroon count? That's a local football colour. <laughs> well, I, I think they probably have an advantage. Um, so there seems to be something to do with the judgment of other people wearing red, but also our own behaviour when we wear red as well. So I don't study people. I study other animals that, due to their underlying uh, sensory systems or due to their learned associations, get caught in these sensory traps just like us. They have a bias and then... Stimuli is presented usually in some other context, and suddenly what was very functional and adaptive to respond to becomes something that has a fitness cost. And the two groups I want to talk about today are insects that get fooled into mating with sexually deceptive orchids. And these are birds, this is a range of birds actually. These are the birds that get caught in the light features in New York the September 11 memorial light features, which are only turned on for a few days each year, but it just coincides with the bird migration period and the birds get very attracted to those lights. Um, so I also live in a brightly lit city near a whole lot of birds, Auckland, Tamaki Makoto, and um, it's a problem here. Oh, I should vote. Uh, who here is more interested in orchids and how they fool their pollinators? There's going to be a lot of sperm in that story. <laughs> yeah. So all about mating behaviour and things like that. And who is more interested in using seabirds' sensory features and sensory things in their conservation? Okay, you guys are a little outvoted, but slightly more from the orchids, perhaps. All right. I should just keep an eye on the time too. Have we got a clock? I'll just grab my phone so I can look at the time. Okay. Right, sexual deception. This is a orchid, Cryptostylus subulata, and this is a little ichneumonid wasp, and he's been fooled into trying to mate with the flower. And as he exits the flower, you can see he ends up with the pollen attached to the tip of his abdomen, and then he off he flies with the pollen attached to uh, get fooled and transfer that to another one. Um, this is actually the same genus of orchid that has the same pollinator, it just has quite a different appearance. But when I was studying these, I noticed that after they'd been visited by the orchid, by the pollinator, if you zoomed in, there was this mysterious blob here. And at first I thought perhaps it's just stigmatic 
goo that's been mushed around as that pollinator, you know, mates in, with the flower because it's quite um, active and moving around with the flower. But if you look at it under the microscope, it's actually heaps and heaps of sperm. So the picture here is not too clear, actually, but each little blue dot or blue thread is a sperm. And I found that in 73% of the orchid visits I watched, there was sperm on the flower afterwards. And this was quite a surprising little paper about how, because people often describe this as pseudo-copulation, but I think, I think this genuinely is an actual copulation with wasting of the sperm. And, you know, at first we sort of thought of it as somewhat of an interesting but quirky natural history phenomenon. But the more I thought about it, the more I felt that there was a bigger evolutionary question in this. And maybe there was some strategy. It wasn't an accident that the orchid caused the pollinator to ejaculate, that actually it might be a fundamental part of the orchid strategy. Um, the first step towards thinking about this was kind of noticing who gets fooled into mating with orchids. And I noticed that nearly all of the insects that get fooled into sexual deception with orchids around the world, they were nearly all um, parasitoid wasps and solitary bees. So a lot of the groups that pollinate rewarding orchids and get their nectar, beetles, butterflies, and that are absent or largely absent from this type of pollination. And one thing about these types of parasitoid wasps and solitary bees is that they're monandrous, so the female will only mate once with the male. So there's quite a lot of competition between the males to find the females. When the females start signalling, they're ready to mate, the males really have to hurry and find them. The other thing is that the males are quite sperm limited in this group. They don't produce vast amounts of sperm. They tend to have a limited amount that they have to spend, you know, potentially quite strategically throughout their life. So that got me thinking, is there an impact or cost to this, to the individual wasp, to the population of pollinators, and also kind of a broader evolutionary one? And I wanted to know that do orchids cause the pollinators to be sperm depleted, so to run out of sperm in a way that would impact their ability to mate effectively? Um, do those sperm depleted males still go on and mate with females so that the females miss out on sperm as well? Because if the females are only going to mate once and she mates with a male who transfers seminal fluid but no sperm, you know, her job is, is, is complete in some ways and she's ready to, to reproduce. She hasn't actually got any sperm. I was interested in whether there was population level differences, so in areas with and without orchids. Because the wasp is widespread and ubiquitous, but the orchid is just patchy. And I thought, what if we could look at places with orchids and places without and see if there was a difference in that same species of wasp? And then the last thing is, well, why, you know, if this is costly, why doesn't the whole thing go extinct? Why don't the pollinators get, you know, driven into the ground, deprived of sperm? And why, how can the orchids get pollinated if they're doing that? So we did lots of field work at sites with orchids and without. These are in Sydney, actually. Um, the sites were all two kilometres apart, which is meant to be beyond the dispersal distance of this wasp or the travel distance. And we tried to match them as well as we could, having the same types of vegetation and soils and things. And then we put out a little bait orchid. Um, I don't, if anyone's worked with sexually deceptive orchids, if you bring a little bait orchid out, and they're your pollinators around, it will find you quickly and be like, ah, ah, trying to get into your hand for the orchid. And if they're not there, they just won't show up. So you can actually quite quickly attract insects. And then we allowed insects as they arrive to either mate or not mate with the orchid. We watched their behaviour. We caught them um, either bef before or after mating with an orchid. And we looked how much sperm they had. And all of this was done by... Not me. Well, I helped a bit, but it was driven entirely by Amy Broughton Martin, my uh, PhD at the time. Do the insects also mate with insects? Or they do mate with the females, yes, but they typically uh, are more attracted to the orchid than the female insect. So um, the insect, the orchids are very overwhelmingly attractive. It's a smell that attracts them primarily, and they would rather mate with the orchid than a female. So first of all, we found that mating with orchids does take quite a lot of sperm. So this little graph shows how much sperm was left over in that male 
per millimetre of seminal vesicle. So if an insect had not mated with an orchid, here we go, he still had this much sperm in his body, but the ones that we let them go ahead and mate, they had less sperm. And we worked out that 45% of those males would then be sperm limited. And then if they were to mate immediately with a female, they wouldn't have the sperm to transfer. So it takes a lot of sperm to mate with an orchid. Uh, we also found that the wasps from orchid site had all these other differences as well. So we attributed these to having evolved with the orchids or sort of selection pressure from the orchids in those sites. We found that they actually had more sperm in their bodies in general. And I thought it was going to be less because I thought, oh, they're spending it on all these orchids. But actually, the ones at orchid sites actually had more sperm. Um, but they were spending it real wisely. So they had much smaller ejaculates. So each time they were mating, they were using a lot less sperm. Um, they also short, mated for a much shorter period of time. They also had longer antennae. Now, the way that they find the orchid is through smell, right? And their smell receptors are on their antennae. And I thought, oh my goodness, they're evolving. It's a counter adaptation, like a cuckoo and its host. And I've, the pollinator is evolving to better better avoid these orchids, you know, it's more chemoreceptors or something and it's doing better. And so that was my idea. Maybe they're evolving to better detect orchids at some sort of arms race. So I said, oh, okay, well, that would mean that any individual with a longer antennae, surely they should avoid the orchids. But actually, they were more likely to be full. <laughs> so we went back to the drawing board at that point and said, okay, it's not an arms race because the ones that are experiencing orchids aren't avoiding them. Um, they're evolving longer antennae, smaller ejaculates, shorter mating. Now, if there's any beetle people in the room, or on Zoom, um, maybe you suddenly go, oh, hang on, these traits are usually associated with scramble competition when lots of males are scrambling to be the first male to mate with each female as they emerge, they typically evolve those traits. Longer antennae for finding them, often bigger wings for traveling faster. Smaller ejaculates, because they want to mate with as many females as possible. Shorter matings, hurrying up to get the job done. So I don't think that male wasps are evolving to avoid orchids. I think they're evolving to mate with as many orchids and females as they can. So I don't think they actually know that they've been fooled or anything. I think they're like, right, got to get this job done well. All these females available. Let's do it. Which kind of brings me back to this question of if there's some sort of impact and they're stealing the sperm and the males are running out of sperm to use with real females, um, why isn't this system falling apart? And it's not like this is unusual. Sexual deception is a really common strategy. This is a little map of sexual deception around the world, which you may find useful. Um, so some places like North America have zero sexually deceptive orchids, whereas other places like um, Australia and, well, here we go. Oh, I'm doing the wrong button. Um, there's a lot of species. Well, actually, let's start with Europe. So Mediterranean Europe has kind of two orchid lineages, so it seems that sexual deception has evolved twice in that part of Europe, but in Australia, where there's sort of equivalent numbers, it looks like it's more like the result of maybe six to eight, maybe Catherine is the right person to check their uh, independent evolutions of sexual deception. So it's very common. It's not some sort of dead-end strategy. So let's go back to pie chart. I love a good pie chart. Um, I mentioned that all these pollinators that seem to do this job are kind of sperm limited. There's one other thing that they all are. That's haplodiploid. So all of the ants and the bees and the wasps are haplodiploid. But what it means, if you're a haplodiploid female, you only need sperm if you're going to produce a daughter. So if you miss out on sperm because you know, the males in your population are mating with orchids, you can still reproduce, but you can only make sons. 
Um, so in their regular day, even when they have sperm, they individually apply sperm to each egg as they lay it. And if they add a sperm, it becomes a daughter. And if they don't add a sperm, it becomes a son. And I thought if I was an orchid and I wanted to generate a lot of male insects, I could get a haploid diploid pollinator and steal its sperm so that it can only make sun. Potentially the best idea I've ever had, actually. Well, work-related idea. I've had other good ideas. I thought maybe it might go like this. So let's say the male insects are wasting their sperm on the orchids, so the female insects are deprived of sperm. If you were a sexually deceptive orchid with a diploid pollinator, like a fly or a beetle, all going to go poorly was my prediction that you might have poor or very low or no reproduction and that would mean um, that you end up with fewer pollinators by reproduction there I mean the insects reproduction so you end up with fewer insects around and that in turn would lead to low orchid fitness and extinction whereas if you picked somebody who could cope with your deception and you stole their sperm the female pollinators might still produce sons and then you might get even more pollinators because you were generating a male by sex ratio in your pollinator. And that might be great for an orchid. You might have really high success. So Amy, maths genius that she is, did some modelling of this, and that all held together very beautifully from a mathematical perspective. So she did model the population dynamics over many, many generations, kind of using this evolutionary modelling stuff, and she used trait data from her fieldwork in the literature to inform that. And she did indeed find that if you made a haploid diploid pollinator, it did generate a male by a sex ratio, and they didn't go extinct even at high density. So the modeling worked. The fieldwork was much more tricky. Originally, we wanted to do field surveys and just get a sense of how many male and female insects there were. And we just had just no success because they won't visit you unless you have an orchid and then only the males visit you. So we never knew how many females there were. So we turned to Instagram. So we used um, online images, but we also used specimens and databases from the, the ALA and iNaturalist, Instagram and Facebook and museum specimens and also pest biocontrol surveys to try and get a sense of how many males and females there were of these insects all across Australia and New Zealand. And then we did some uh, field uh, we did some lab experiments, actually. So this was Amy's um, use of museum records. So she had all these kind of sites with and without orchids that she categorised, and then she looked at any specimens of our pollinator. She found 626 images or museum specimens, and then we also picked kind of like a control that was very, very similar ecologically. It laid its eggs in the same host. It does also in the same wasp family, but it's not at all a sexually deceived orchid pollinator. And what we found was that, yes, at wasps, at sites, so our pollinator, when there was no orchids, it was 40% male, and at sites where there were orchids, it went to 70% male. Now, we removed any specimens that we thought might have been lodged by orchid people, so we didn't, you know, Orchid people are going to find their pollinators and then lodge them at the museum. And so we removed any that had pollen on them or that we um, we looked up the names of all the people who'd lodged them to see if they had any known association with publishing or anything. And we removed any of them from that. Um, and incidentally, our control wasp species all around Australia and New Zealand was always 30% male, 70% female. And actually, the more orchids at a site, the more museum records, more herbarium records for orchids, the more likely they were to have male wasps lodged. So potentially, potentially we're actually right, but we don't know for sure, but we think that it's manipulating the sex ratio. Uh, and the last thing on that I want to mention is that we did these lab experiments. It was locked down and couldn't do any field work, and we thought, hey, let's be the orchids. Let's impose orchid-like selection on a population of insects. And we found there was another parasitoid wasp that um, Manahari Sandaniaka from the Plant and Food Research, she just happened to have a population of a very similar wasp for agricultural pest stuff. And we got males from it and mated them to different females and then counted how many female and male offspring those females could make. And oh my goodness, the males, 
definitely seem to be running out of sperm. So if you were the male's uh, third, fourth or fifth mate, then you had to make extra sons. So if you had, you could say, if you were a female that mated with a male that already mated with a couple of orchids, you would be limited in the number of daughters you produce because you just wouldn't get enough sperm from them. Over so, what period of time? Uh, oh, this was over, if they don't live that long, these ones, they're like a... Four weeks, I think. So this was... Uh, oh, a few days between each mating. So it's all kind of circumstantially building up. Maybe it really was the best idea I ever had. And if you're, um, I'm going to skip this a little bit, but if you're interested in orchids, I've collated a range of further reading there, which I hope will be enlightening. So let's just have a quick look at some seabird stuff before we finish up. Um, and I want to hear, acknowledge Totoko, um, a PhD student I had who was very much the seabird expert and um, I'd, already, I'd just been working on plants and pollinators all this time and she joined my lab with all the seabird know-how and it all went from there. So seabirds are super interesting. I'd never worked on vertebrates before, um, but seabirds are really interesting for sensory stuff because they have incredibly sensitive sensory systems. Um, they've got a really difficult life, seabirds. They are pelagic and they have to travel long distances over sea that seas that are you know, apparently quite featureless to us for foraging, migration, and also their phylopatry where they go home to their original colony to reproduce. The colonies are busy. This is a um, gannet colony that's right near Auckland. If you've been to Auckland, I'm sure you've visited these gannets. Uh, I take my classes there for our second year zoology field trips. And they're busy, busy colonies. And within that, the seabirds have to find their own partner, find their own chick. Often they're doing that nocturnally as well. So if you're at a seabird colony at night, when a seabird lands, you hear it go, well, first you hear the thump, and then you hear it go. You can actually hear them sniffing as they're walking around in the colony looking for their own burrow. Uh, also, seabirds, large vertebrates, they have a long-term pair bond, so they do a lot of mate choice and courtship, so they have a lot of sensory aspects to that and, and um, that a lot of uh, experience with assessing each other using colours and smells and things. So they've got a lot of kind of sensory acuity, which I think is often not necessarily well recognised. Um, they're also a group of birds that's very threatened. The IU, one of the IUCN's most... IUCN's most at-risk animal groups. And also, when I moved there, I had no idea, but um, the Auckland region, the Holraki Gulf, around Tamaki Makoto, uh, which is the Toreo name, Toreo Mongi name for Auckland, 25% uh, of the world's seabirds nest and breed there. So it's quite globally important for seabirds and very diverse as well. There's about uh, 77 seabird and shorebird species in New Zealand. There's about 60 forest birds. So there's actually a really high diversity of them there. And when I looked at the types of threats that were most important for seabirds, habitat loss, climate change, introduced predators, fishery bycatch, artificial light and collisions and plastic ingestion, I feel like there's a sensory aspect, maybe not to climate change, but I definitely saw sensory aspects to those other threats and I thought well maybe if they have if we explore the sensory aspects of those threats maybe we can come up with some sensory solutions. So habitat loss something that um, is very common in New Zealand is removing the predators the introduced predators from an area and then attempting to attract the native animals back to it often native seabirds and one thing that people do is they have speakers playing bird calls so the idea is that they use a sensory anchor because these birds are phylopatric, you've got to lure them to your new nesting site. So it's safe to come back. We've got nest boxes. We've got rid of all the rats. Come on back. And people often play recorded calls and they often add nest material to the nest boxes. You know, the idea, try and make them smell attractive, smell like home. So it's widely attempted, but there's often assessment of how it works is quite tricky because it's often done by groups who are not doing controls. They're, they're playing the bird call all the time at the site. And also what calls and scents should you use? People often have a sense that 
because the seabirds are kind of a, one of the more basal lineages of birds that they might have less sophisticated everything, including their calls. But actually they, they do have quite variable calls that mean different things. So this is Megan. Um, and she did this particular study on grey-faced petrel, the oi. And she went to the, spent a long time hanging around the colonies with her little microphone actually recording the calls so that she could categorise them as calls associated with different behaviours. And she did an experiment where she played the calls at night in an area where the seabirds are flying past and then just counted how many birds flew past. I mean, we don't know if it was, we don't know how often the same bird flew past. So we don't know if it's the number of individual seabirds, so we describe it as the number of attractions. Um, the third call there, the wah-wah, is this one, wah 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 which people often do to attract seabirds, particularly petrels. They just seem to be very attracted to it. And we did silent controls as well. So we kind of played these in random orders at night. It's actually lovely field work, sitting up on a little, you know, overlooking the sea, cups of tea, writing down the birds, very nice. Um, and so Megan found the only kind of, there was a bit of a trend for its attraction call. Definitely not any particular interest in the aggression call and that wawa call was kind of number one. So we think the type of call is probably quite important if you want to play calls to attract birds. We also did the nest material thing. Um, we had nest boxes for two different colonies for two different seabirds and we put nest material in half of them in control, and then this little grip here shows after a couple of years how many of them occupied. So no strong patterns there. Certainly didn't look like it was luring more birds to occupy the boxes with the nest material added. It doesn't look like it deterred them either. So, you know, no harm done, I think, if you want to put this. Okay. So another thing that we worked on was um, bycatch and deck strike. So seabirds often land on boats when they're fishing or even cruise ships as well, which is quite a problem in the Auckland Harbour. And um, the idea is that perhaps they're disoriented. They think it's the moon, they're confused, but at any rate, they definitely land on brightly lit fishing boats and squid jiggers. And a little lockdown project, we were looking for something we could do just with the available kind of data and specimens. And we wondered whether Seabirds that had more sensitive sensory systems were being trapped by fishing boats. Was it a sensory trap? The smells of all the fishing, the burly, the lures, the guts and stuff, and also the bright lights. And this is my PhD, Ariel. Um, so we just got data from the literature on things to do with the life history for 70 species of seabirds, which get reported as bycatch around New Zealand. Um, we added in a bunch of stuff to do with their skeleton, like the bodies. So we measured, is it that they get entangled because of their legs or wings or bill, something spiky <laughs> that sticks out? Or is it actually their sensory sensitivity? Um, because what we were noticing was that the birds that were more often reported as bycatch didn't correlate with just their abundance. So it's not just that the more common birds get caught. Um, and then we looked at the bycatch data. So we had reported bycatch, and then there's various kind of government indices of the risk of bycatch based on different types of fishing. And we certainly found for the first time that, yes, there is like a skeletal thing. So that's a little bit, it looks like a chicken drumstick, doesn't it? It's meant to be their wing. <laughs> that's a seabird wing. Um, so birds that had, you know, absolutely bigger wings were more likely to be reported in bycatch. But interesting, the sensory stuff came through as well. So species with relatively bigger eyes and nostrils were also more likely to be caught. And it wasn't just a covariate that, oh, they're just the birds that have the bigger wings. It was actually the, the relative size of their eyes and nostrils. So I think perhaps there is a sensory aspect to bycatch. Um, Ariel also did some work on artificial light. So this is my little drawing of Auckland. Here's a map. You can see how, so Auckland is up there on that very skinniest part of New Zealand. Here we are. Uh, so it's not very much land between one side or the other. And a lot of the birds are moving across that space all the time and through those bright city lights of Auckland. So we worked with one of the animal welfare centres 
that gets birds taken to them by members of you know the public when they find an injured bird. And all of these seabird species that people found, um, we mapped where they'd been found, and also the night sky brightness from kind of satellite imagery. So we had kind of the address where somebody from the community had found that bird and we overlaid it with a map of brightness. And we absolutely found that there was more seabird groundings when the, the lights were brighter. So that was, uh, I think, quite useful. We, the plan now is to sort of work with people who run those buildings that are brightly lit and talk to them about options to maybe reduce the impact they're having on the seabirds at maybe at particular times of year or times of night. Last little thing, plastic ingestion. So we're looking at the colours of plastics that birds ingest, but there's also a smell aspect to it too. I'm not sure if you know about that, but seabirds often find their prey by smell. They follow dimethyl sulphide. And the dimethyl sulphide is originally produced by small little phytoplankton things, but they are preyed upon by bigger things, which are preyed upon by fish. And so the seabirds are eating the bigger crustaceans and fish and things. And so they also follow that dimethyl sulfide. But you know what else makes dimethyl sulfide in the sea? Plastic. We've just been doing some experiments with bottle caps and balloons um, in the, that we put in bags in the sea and we're monitoring how they change smell and colour over time. And they absolutely start to produce dimethyl sulfide and smell like something seabirds associate with dinner. So. This was even for those, you know, those balloons that are sold as biodegradable. 12 months later, they're still looking very good in the sea. So no more balloons at birthday parties. And for those of you on Zoom, oh, how do I look straight to the camera? No more balloons. Um, we realised there was actually sort of no database on plastic ingestion for New Zealand seabirds or birds in general. And so we started kind of building that. So this is some of my students uh, doing different sized projects and the different birds that have been checking for plastics. Um, so some of this work's completed. So um, Ariel, incredible, incredible researcher. So she's dissected 430 birds. And these are birds that get found on the beaches. There's a program called Beach Patrol in New Zealand where the Birds New Zealand volunteers actually check the beaches for dead birds and they take them to museums or to the Department of Conservation. Um, so the numbers here is how many individuals out of her total had plastic in the gut. So out of her Buller's shear waters, 19 of the 282 had plastic. This is just for the real seabird lovers if you want to know the species. Um, and Kamia Patel has finished her project on albatross gannets and shags. Surprisingly rare, actually. I really thought the albatrosses would be, have a lot of plastic, but she found, you know, none of the albatrosses she looked at. I should have put how many there were, but she looked at a whole bunch of them and none of them had plastic. This population, these New Zealand ones. Uh, and she, so she only found three birds out of the... 125 that she looked at that had plastic in their gut, but they nearly all had plastic in their poo, microplastics in that piece. So that's where we're at with that one. So I'm always interested to meet other people doing plastic in the gut. Um, oh, this was Kamia's project about the colours and smells. Uh, the last thing I was going to mention is, so Ariel is a really passionate researcher and she's doing this project on seabirds and she said, you know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to put a T-Rex into a CT scanner. Can you make it happen? And we thought about it and we realised, well, seabirds are basically dinosaurs. So that's what she did. She put a whole bunch of seabirds through the CT scanner, the medical imager. Um, it's cool that she puts the, the seabird in a little thing and then it comes through there. And then from that, we get like a visual thing. We can do the slices. And then from that, Ariel's made these kind of 3D endocasts of what the brain would have looked like from the skull of that T-Rex, no, sorry, the, the seabird. <laughs> and then she's measuring the volume of some sensory structures that you can kind of get a sense for from that, the olfactory bulb and the midbrain. And just some, oh, look, there it is. It's rotating around. Um, and what we've found so far is that of the seabirds that collide with city buildings from our animal welfare data, Ones with larger midbrains, which is associated with vision, they're the ones that are colliding more often. 
And of the ones that are eating plastic, the ones with larger olfactory bulbs are eating more plastics. So that's pretty interesting, I think. So I also study some other stuff like splachnacy moss. This is a moss that grows on animal remains like carcasses. This is a deer skull, and that's my PhD, Ryan Derenay, who's just finished that. He's an excellent botanist who's recently completed his PhD. He's worked previously <laughs> for the US um, Wildlife, um, Fish and Wildlife Service in Guam and Alaska. And if you're looking for an excellent botanist who knows all of stuff to do with threatened plant work and is very good at field work, you might like to contact him. Um, I also have other PhDs doing um, kind of more agricultural research on pollination. So we're doing one on blueberries at the moment. Max has a passion for the moths. So he's looking at uh, the importance of moths for all sorts of pollination agricultural systems, but particularly blueberries. And why am I here? I'm hoping to measure fruit and fungi. So I also have students who work on these colourful fruit and fungi in New Zealand. Um, so that's um, Amy who is there, but also Gyeongsu Lee, who's now doing a PhD on lip reptile preferences for fruits, and my master's student, Gabrielle Jones. So I thank all my collaborators, the people who've given me permission to do field work and my students. So Nai Takoto Iwi in Northland and Takawaro Iwi in the Waitakere region, uh, which is around Auckland for access to plants and animals and things, uh, funding. And also I've got my childcare on there because I find for me the key thing for you know, getting a bit of work done, it's not actually funding, it's time. And um, I really appreciate the other people like my husband, Greg Holwell, and our family and our neighbours who look after our kids with us as well so that we can get some jobs done. Now, at this point, potentially, if you are um, an early career researcher, uh, at this point in a talk, you might be thinking, gosh, this person's done so much, um, you know, I myself will never achieve this. And I just want to reassure you that it's absolutely the product of time. Um, I'm very much, my priority is, is not work. It's, you know, being a mum and a partner and, you know, a sister and a daughter, those things in my life are the, the most important things to me. And I've made this handy infographic to show you um, how it all fits together with being pregnant and having terrible morning sickness, babies, workplace. It's not necessarily my workplace uh, has not had many women taking time off their babies. And that was quite a shock to my department. Um, and also wanting to point out that the lead author papers, which are shown there in red, are few and far between and I do all my research with my students. So all my publications are really just the time effect, you know, of just the time that, have, that has happened. And also, uh, I guess I'll just emphasize again, the importance of relationships in nature, but also with your colleagues and family as you, you know, navigate the rich tapestry that is life. So thank you very much, everybody. Then that was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm sure